Well, today I'm joined by Father, Father Evan Armitas. Father, Ar- Father Evan Armitas, I'm struggling to say this apparently to start, and we were just going over the pronunciation. You were. Um, but he's a, a parish priest, author of multiple books. You can find him on Ancient Faith Radio as well. And today we're going to be talking about one of his books, Toolkit for Spiritual Growth. And I'm really excited to have you here, Father Evan. Thank you so much for taking the time for this. It's a real pleasure, Austin. Um, we've never met. I was telling you before, it's nice to meet you. You know, one of my parishioners, uh, although I was talking to some of them today, uh, it's a feast day in the Orthodox Church, feast of the Dormition of the Mother of God, big feast day in the church. And someone asked me uh, what my afternoon looked like. And I said, well, I have a number of appointments and then I'm going to be on Gospel Simplicity. And they said, oh, that's fantastic. They're ah. fans of the show and uh, listen in and watch regularly. So you've got uh, a number of people in our community that uh, enjoy your program. Well, I'm honored to hear that, and they're too kind for doing so. And I'm really excited to have you on today. It's been an interview that's been requested by multiple people, and I've enjoyed your book in the past. Usually, actually, I read books and then immediately like settle in for an interview. Mm -hmm. I was actually reading your book a while ago just for pleasure. I I sometimes get to do that. That's not just for YouTube. Uh, (laughs) And then finally got around to doing this. I'm excited. But your, your book, you know, the title is Toolkit for Spiritual Growth, and you talk about prayer, almsgiving, and fasting in it. We're going to cover those three things today. But this might seem like an obvious question to start with, but I think it's a helpful place to start, hopefully. And that is, when you talk about spiritual growth, what do you have in mind for that? And how might someone know if they're growing spiritually? Sure, sure. Well, in in the tradition that I grew up in, you know, we speak about orthodoxia, you know, right belief, right glory, right practice. And connected to that is orthopraxia, uh, right action. And I think from very early on, you know, both in scripture and then in the early writings of the church and many of the saints who wrote, known to us sometimes as the apostolic or post-apostolic fathers or the Cappadocians, if if you're familiar with church history, um, there's an emphasis um, on the actions that a Christian takes based on their beliefs. And all of those leading to, if you will, spiritual growth. And as you said, you know, what is what is spiritual growth? Um, I made it today in thinking about spiritual growth through the lens of the feast that we just celebrated. Um, Oftentimes people are a little confused by the Orthodox Church's devotion to Mary, um, the mother of God. Um, We call her the Theotokos or God bearer or ever virgin. Um, And today when I was was preaching in the homily during the the liturgy this morning, um, I I brought out a measuring tape and um, had a lot of fun with that and asked the kids in liturgy today, you know, what would you like me to measure? And they had me measure different things, you know, uh, the size of one of the icons, you know, the the width of the aisle. Uh, One of them wanted to measure me, see how tall I am. And, um, And I asked them, you know, why do you think I might be talking about a measuring tape and this little girl about eight years old said well isn't it true uh, father that we think of Mary as the standard of a Christian and so she had nailed it of course that you know Mary is the standard well I bring that up because you know Mary is important to us as Christians because she lived a life um, that was dedicated to Jesus And she was with Jesus from the time in which she first heard uh, from God through the archangel that he was going to enter the world and save humanity. She was with Jesus through all of his miracles and teachings. She was with him at his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and even there at Pentecost. And her life was one of devotion to Christ. So when you ask that question, you know, what does spiritual growth look like? In, in the most basic way, it looks like a life that's lived in close relationship with Christ. Um, and these disciplines, you know, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, all of them put us into a right relationship with our Lord. That does mean that a Christian should, through the relationship that they have with Christ and through spiritual disciplines, through, through certain spiritual practices, um, they should start to, to bear fruit. You know, what, what kind of fruit? Um, you know, some basic things might come to mind. 
generosity. You know, so if I'm a Christian and I'm working, you know, to be closer to Christ through certain spiritual disciplines that he's given me, um, then it, I would expect that over time, when I encountered someone in need, my response to them would be generosity, would be compassion. Another spiritual fruit might be that when I encounter a, a difficult situation and a difficult person, when I'm wronged, that instead of judgment, I might have mercy, I might forgive. Um, if I'm a parent and I've got children, um, I might learn that through my relationship with Christ and, and spiritual growth that patience and long suffering um, become more an aspect of how I live. And so in a sense, you know, there's a likeness to Christ. We, we begin to be little Christ. I think it's so important to realize that the first people to call people Christians were not Christians. They were non-Christians and they saw people acting like Christ and they said, oh, they're like little Christ's, they're little Jesus's, you know, going around. And of course, you know, that development of spiritual growth um, certainly occurs within the context of love, through the gateway virtue of humility. Um, and I would also say uh, a constant repentance. You know, when the Lord says, repent, he, he doesn't mean once. He puts it in the imperative, infinitive command, be repenting. And so there's a constant renewal uh, and redirection of our lives. So those are some of the thoughts that come to mind when you ask that question, you know, what, what does it look like and how do we, in fact, know we're growing spiritually? I think the last thing maybe to say, Austin, I think a real good measure is the people around us. You know, our spouse, our friends, our parents, our children, our coworkers, the members in our community, do they notice a difference, you know, in how we are living based in the faith that we have in Jesus, right? To just simply think that we're in Christ, but it not be demonstrated in our life. You know, Christ is pretty clear when he says, you know, those types of trees that don't bear fruit will be cut down. And so we need to bear that fruit of a life in Christ. Yeah, I love that. And just a shout out to that little girl for such a wonderful answer uh, to your question mm -hmm. today at that service. I'm sure her parents were delighted if, uh, <laughs> if they heard that. Yeah, I think uh, the whole church got quiet. There was quite a number of people in church and everybody was like, oh. I mean, it was such a beautiful answer. Right? That really, really is. That's wonderful. And I, I appreciate that. Uh, tying into the, the feast today as well as kind of giving uh, the the Orthodox view of Mary there in context of how it can be helpful to work as a, Mary can work as a, a standard for her spiritual standard. growth. That's a really helpful way of looking at that. And as we think about spiritual growth, today we're going to go through kind of the cle three classic like pillars of mm -hmm. uh, Christian mm -hmm. spirituality. And we're going to talk about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And I want to start with prayer. And I really enjoyed how you talked about this in your book and you highlighted mm -hmm. this idea that so many people and myself included they might grow up particularly maybe in like a protestant context where prayer is kind of just like this extemporaneous off the top of your head mm -hmm. kind of thing I often laugh that you know looking back i was told as a kid like how do you pray oh just talk to god as though that was like a normal thing to do like as though we had any point <laughs> of reference for how one goes right. about talking to god right but the implied thing was there that I guess talking to God was just like talking to anyone else. And it often mm -hmm. kind of results in almost like a dear diary sort of prayer, yeah. right? Like just whatever's off the top of your head. And you write in your book that you're not trying to like uh, encourage people to eradicate this type of prayer entirely from their lives, but that mm -hmm. maybe they should consider like deprioritizing it, not mm -hmm. giving it like that central throne in their yeah. prayer life. And so why is that? What What is it that we maybe lose when we focus too much on this, mm -hmm. just pray whatever comes to mind type of approach? Yeah. Austin, I think to, to answer that question, we have to step back a bit and consider, you know, why why are we praying at all? You know, and I think there's some really bad answers out there. You know, sometimes people sort of 
go through the idea of, well, God needs us to pray to him. He needs us to worship him. Well, if that's true, then God's not God because then he needs something. He's imperfect. You know, God doesn't need us to worship him. God doesn't need us to pray to him, right? Um, we really should frame that in a different way uh, if we're talking about, you know, the, the necessity and reason for prayer. I think one of the ways that we can approach that is to say, you know, something happened to us as human beings. Um, it happened a long time ago, but at the same time, it's something that happens today, happens every day. And, you know, hearkening back to the feast, you know, the Orthodox Church has an icon that it places at the back in the apse of the church on the east end behind the altar. And it's an icon of Mary that's entitled more spacious than the heavens. And it shows Mary, an oversized Mary, uh, you know, holding in her lap or near her bosom, uh, the Christ child. And what the icon is depicting is the reality that within Mary came to dwell the one who created the heavens. And so her womb became more spacious than the heavens. And this oversized Mary is really a visual clue for all of us that if we wish to ourselves bear Christ, to be a Christ bearer, a Christophoros, Christopher, then we have to become a bit bigger than we currently are. Well, the way that we talk about this in scripture is, is really through the lens and the description in Genesis of the fall. You know, fall was an event in which our humanity which had been created in the image and likeness of God and in, and in a level of intimacy that's even hard to fathom. It, scripture describes this as walking with God in the garden, you know, which is a paradise. And having deep intimacy with God and relationship. And through a self-directedness, we often don't really quite understand this whole thing about God giving us a command and then we, we break the commandment. But... But really, the, the wisdom of the church there is to say, we became self-willed. You know, we went away from being in relationship and communion and operating and living in such a way to saying, no, I'm going to go my way. I'm going to make my own decisions. And that decision in the garden is a decision that we repeat. You know, the Orthodox Church does not have a theology of original sin, as you'll find it in the West. Um, we did not, and we don't believe, that we inherited the sin of Adam in the sense of his guilt. We did inherit the consequences of that decision, death, propensity to sin, a disfigurement of the human condition. And so we're, we're disfigured, we're disordered. And if you think about what it means to be a human person, this is important to the, the rest of the book and, and really all of these disciplines. The human person is a mixture, a blend of the material and the immaterial, right? Body and soul. We could add into that, you know, taking the line of thinking that Paul takes, that we also have roughly translated maybe in English as mind or intellect, but what Paul calls the noose, right? Now, that kind of mixture and blend of a human person was rightly balanced, rightly ordered in the garden through self-will and self-direction, it becomes fractured. It becomes disordered. And perhaps our news, our intellect, our mind, it no longer operates in the way that it should. I like to tell the story of, you know, Native Americans in encountering Westerners' expansion into you know, what was traditionally Native American lands and seeing the behavior of certain people would sometimes say, those people don't think right and they touch their hearts. You know, they wouldn't touch their head. And prayer is not so much given to us by God so that we can worship and adore him, but it's therapeutic. God is trying to reorient 
and reunite how we think with our heart. And so some people have described prayer as <laughs> the journey of 10 inches of getting the mind to descend into the heart, which is the longest journey in the universe. And so when you speak of, you know, contemporary or extemporaneous prayer where someone just is speaking, um, let's say just whatever's on their mind, it seems as if what first needs to happen is a reconditioning. So if one begins with whatever's on their mind, whatever they're thinking, they may be wrong-headed and wrong-hearted about their prayer. So for example, in Scripture, Christ asks us to pray first for our enemies. In liturgical prayer, that's ensconced. If you're using a prayer book and you're going through prayers, you pray first for your enemies. You don't pray first for your loved ones. Because God is reorienting us, right? Or you can think of it this way. When Israel was given a prayer book, it was given the Psalms. And the Psalms expressed God's truth, poetically often, right? And Israel learned to sing and to memorize and to pray those prayers. And in so doing, it started to acquire, if you will, the heart of God, even the thoughts of God. We know scripture says that his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. And so beginning with extemporaneous prayers or prayers that are whatever are on my mind or my heart, you just might be still operating in that disfigured and disordered way. Another example of that is when Christ himself is asked to teach his disciples how to pray, he doesn't say, whatever's on your mind. Instead, he gives them a liturgical prayer, right? He gives them a way to pray, a structure. Now, out of that structure, it's sort of like this. If you were to say to, you know, your child, I want you to go play golf, and you hand him a ball and a club, and you sit him out in the backyard, and you just let him go at it. Would they be able to hit a golf ball? Would they be able to hit it straight? Probably not. I mean, maybe if they stayed out there for days and days, but they might develop some bad habits. They might develop some habits that were hard to break. But instead, if you taught them how to swing a club, how to strike a ball, and then later on, after much repetition and practice, you turn them loose to play golf on their own, they might be able to do a bit better. And, and something, simpler is going, something similar is going on in, in the practical way in which the church teaches us to pray. It gives us a structure and within that structure, it gives us freedom. But it doesn't start with, here's all the freedom you want, and then later we'll apply some structure, right? So if you just think about it, um, praying with structure is a way to reorder our disordered existence. It's a way to reclaim and reshape who we are, the way we think. It brings a therapeutic model to the idea of prayer. And really, it's the biblical model. It's, it's how God has taught his people through scripture to pray. He didn't just turn them loose. Now, of course, within the church's long history of teaching and, and praying, people have learned through liturgical prayer, through structured prayer, to pray from their hearts, right? And to do so in a way um, in which they are now reordered and righteous, right ordered, you know. It's a long answer. Sorry about that, Austin. You do not have to apologize for that at all. That was a wonderful answer. And I think it painted a more compelling picture of prayer than maybe some people 
have encountered before because I think so many of us grow up with maybe a, a deficient sense of the importance of prayer, right back where you started that answer, right? That we do it to get stuff out of God or because God likes it or some God needs mm-hmm. us to do it in some way, but rather that prayer is actually this, this therapeutic action that, that's helping us reorient ourselves mm-hmm. um, yeah. in, in this beautiful way. And I think when we look at it that way, all of a sudden it's like, oh, prayer is, is more than I thought. And then hopefully recognizing the importance of prayer, we say, well, then how should I pray? Just like the disciples yeah. asked Jesus. I always love mm-hmm. the fact that they asked that um, and he gave them a structured prayer. To yeah. repeat. And speaking of structure, one of the things that jumped out to me in your book was that you write one of the biggest mistakes that we make when it comes to prayer is discounting our need for a place to pray. And yeah. I love that because Again, I did not grow up. It was, you know, talk to God anytime, anywhere. And again, not that we're saying you can't do that. No, but not saying that. But there's a value in establishing a place. Can, can you talk to this a bit mm-hmm. about why that's so important? This video is brought to you in part by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is an organization of Christian counselors that exists to help you get the help you need. You can find them by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. And when you use that link, which you can find in the description down below, you will get 10% off your first month and they'll pair you up with a licensed mental health counselor in under 48 hours. Once you've been paired up with a counselor, you can reach them via instant message, phone call, video call, and more. I think you will really enjoy this and I think it could be the first step on your journey to greater mental health. And mental health problems affect all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, every demographic feels the weight of mental health but there are resources available and you don't need to go through this alone, which is why I encourage you to reach out to the amazing people at Faithful Counseling by using that link, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity and taking your first step towards healing and wholeness in your mental health. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, whenever we start to think about answers to these types of questions, it's good to reference ourselves back to the life of Christ Um, Christ went to places to pray. You know, he went to a deserted place. He went to the synagogue. He he went to the temple to pray. Um, He used places to pray. Um, And of course, as you said in asking the question, we're not saying one cannot pray wherever one is. Of course, one should pray wherever one is. But having a place of prayer has always been important to people of faith. Um, one of the things that strikes me, I think it's Genesis 12, I'm going completely from memory here, but it's, you know, when God encounters Abram, who later is renamed Abraham, he tells him to get up and go to a place that I will show you. He's going to direct him to a place. And later when Israel is in um, the wilderness. Wherever they go, they set up the tent of meeting and God God comes to dwell inside that place, that tent of meeting, and Moses goes into that place. And there he meets with God and talks to him as a friend talks uh, to a friend, right, face to face. Later, in the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we know that that place Um, is now within us. In fact, there's a prayer in the church that goes like this, O heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are present in all places and fillest all things, come and abide in me and save my soul, O gracious Lord. That come and abide in me in the original liturgical Greek is enskinosem which is the same that we find in the beginning of the Gospel of John. Come and set up your tent within me. That in a sense, the place that we can go to is within us. You know, God has set up his meeting place within the human heart. So a place. Well, again, going back to that reality that a human person is, is both the material and the immaterial, body and soul, Uh, That means matter matters. Uh, God himself saved us by becoming incarnate. He doesn't ignore 
the physical reality that uh, we as human beings encounter. At times of healing people, he used his garment, the woman who touched him. He used the earth when he made clay and anointed the eyes of the blind men. He used a pool of water. Um, he constantly was using his touch even when he healed the leper. So this physical aspect to prayer, right? Even, even the body, right? When we, when we think about maybe even if we're not used to this idea of going to a place of prayer, perhaps maybe when you were a little lost in, you, you may have put your hands together like I'm doing now. You may have even kneeled, right? You, you acknowledge that there was something physical um, about prayer. Again, in the Orthodox Church, even to, to go like this and make the sign of the cross without any words is a prayer, right? So having a place. Now, one of the things that is important is that we have a place to go, let's say the temple, our church, where we pray. And then we should have a place to go at home to pray. And those two places should be related. I think Christians often get out of sync when they only go to church or only pray at home. That's not witnessed at all in Scripture. Both are needed, the corporate prayer and the private prayer. And in both places, <laughs> there is a place, or both corporate and private prayer has a place of prayer. And in our homes, our homes can be like a little church. And we can have a little altar where we bring our prayer to God. We, we may get up in the morning or before we go to bed or in the middle of the day. We adorn ourselves rightly, you know, to take in mind what Paul said about being clothed in Christ. And we stand before or kneel before God. I don't think one should sit when speaking to God. Of course, if you are sitting and you pray, it's okay. But, you know, if you're going before God, it's good to, to get the body to participate. And standing or kneeling was always the position that Christians prayed in. And even with hands uplifted was, was also what Christians always did. And I would say in our homes, we have places where we do certain things. You know, we don't eat in our bathrooms. And we don't sleep on our kitchen tables. And <laughs> we don't take showers in the garage. And so there should be a place for prayer. And that's not to say that the whole house can't have um, prayer in it. But, you know, it's important to have a place to go, to make our pilgrimage, to have a sacred space that calls us to prayer in our homes. You know, so for me, to have a cross on the wall, to have a lit oil lamp, to have a prayer book, scriptures, maybe a prayer rope, in my walk with Christ, to also have an icon of him, like you can see maybe, oh, it's over on this side, an icon of of the Good Shepherd, but I have an icon in my, my bedroom of Christ where I can go and I can collect myself before God and pray. Um, so those are some of the reasons, you know, why having a place is so important. And I would tell you, having that place will call you to prayer. You know, as you walk by it, as you see it, um, you won't be able to ignore the need to reorient yourself in prayer. I love that. I think that's really powerful. And I think so many of us, even today and over the past couple of years, as people have like worked from home and they're realizing how it's been odd to blur the space of work and home and needing to designate spaces for work. So too, in our prayer lives, right? That we want to have spaces for things and we're realizing that that's actually really important just for how we function and even more so with something like prayer here. I want to pause just for a minute to uh, get into kind of the practical side as we end our mm -hmm. portion on prayer here and just say like if someone is listening to this and they're saying like, wow this seems like a really compelling picture yeah. of prayer to me and i, I want to start praying in maybe a more structured way and mm -hmm. i want to maybe adopt a a rule of prayer or something like this mm -hmm. but they're like i have no idea how to get started this is completely <laughs> different than how i've done it in the past what is just some practical advice you'd give for someone yeah. in that position 
you know, there's a very early Christian document called the Didache. You can look it up online, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, uh, the Didache, early century, first, maybe second century document. Can't remember right now exactly the year in which it was um, written that stipulates how many times to pray and what to pray in a very basic way. So we know from very early on, Christians were structuring their prayer in a certain way and praying certain things. One of the most basic things that Christians have always done is to use a Psalter. A Psalter is a elegant way of talking about the book of Psalms, but the book of Psalms being ordered into settings. The ancient word was kathisma or kathismata, settings of the Psalms. You can go online and purchase a Psalter and the instructions on how to use it are there. So using the Psalter is one way in which people can begin to pray in a structured way. Um, the Lord's Prayer, that's something that Christians should pray every day, multiple times during the day. That's, that's a simple way. Uh, one of the most simple and basic structured prayers that people can begin using is the Jesus Prayer. There's lots of literature out there, the prayer of the heart, it's often called. The short form is, Lord, have mercy on me. The longer version, and there's some derivations, but the longer version is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And that can even be incorporated with one's breath. So you could breathe in with, Lord Jesus Christ, you can breathe out, Son of God, breathe in, have mercy upon me, breathe out, a sinner. So it's, in a sense, breathing in the confession and the acceptance of the Lord Jesus, breathing out and confessing to the world, Son of God, breathing in that you want him to have mercy, and then confessing that one is indeed a sinner, and sinner meaning here um, not one who is in trouble with God, <laughs> that's not the way we view it, but rather one who's been disfigured by wrong decisions and wrong actions and wants to be healed by God. So in this, you know, reality of learning and, and what could we use, those are some, some basic things that we could start to do. Um, you might pick up the Book of the Hours. This is another prayer book, ancient prayer book of the Christian church, uh, utilized th through, throughout time from really almost the time of the apostles. We see in the Book of Acts that, you know, St. Peter was on the rooftop. Um, I think it's Acts 10. And he's praying the hours. Well, those prayers are still available to you. You can you can pick up the a book um, that's called the the book of the hours, and and you can pray the hours. You could learn the daily office of prayer. Um, Christians from the beginning structured the day into first, third, sixth, ninth hour. You had matins. You had evening vesperal prayers. You had prayer after dinner, compline, midnight office. Um, so even learning the structure, the liturgical structure of the day and, and what prayers are said when. You can download apps. You can go to your app store and you can look up Orthodox Prayer Book and you can download it for free. Uh, and you can try the morning and the evening prayers. Um, I would say definitely read the book. You know, in the book, I, I give a basic idea of how to go about going into one's prayer corner, how to set it up, what to do when one gets there, um, what prayers maybe to start saying. I think in the most basic way, we could say prayer should incorporate some opportunity to give thanks. You know, thanks for all that is occurring in our life, even the sorrows and suffering, to intercede for those around us, to ask for God's forgiveness, um, to to speak to God about where we've missed the mark during the day. Um, and then perhaps to add just prayers of the heart and then to close our prayer with maybe a psalm um, and, and maybe a request of God. Um, that could be a basic. Um, but, you know, one of the things I would say, Austin, when, when we ask that question, you know, following a rule of prayer, don't be self-directed only in your prayer. Something we talked about at the beginning. Get help. Get advice. Uh, visit a monastery. If you've never done that, you'll learn a lot about prayer by going to a monastery. Uh, get a prayer book. Um, 
and then some of those other things I mentioned as well with the Psalter and the Book of the Hours, um, learning the liturgical life, uh, those will all assist you. And I would say one last thing. You know, I know a lot of people are used to reading their scriptures, and that's a good thing. You should be doing that. But I think you should read your scriptures as an act of prayer and not just study. You should be praying your scriptures. That's another way in which you can structure your prayer time. Well, there's just a, a treasure trove of information there that people can can take on. And I imagine you would probably encourage people as well. It's not that they have to do each one of these things no. every day, like to start to start somewhere. Um, and I think yeah. that'll probably be the, the wise advice they'll encounter, um, you know, as they should seek advice mm -hmm. from others on starting where they are and finding some structure there. Well, I want to pivot a little bit uh, to talk about fasting. And fasting is another thing that I, while I grew up, you know, hearing about prayer, but maybe not having structure to it. On the other hand, with fasting, if I heard about it at all, which was rarely, it was often brought up as like, hey, it's fine to do that, but just don't go think this like makes you more spiritual or something like that. There was almost mm -hmm. a, a reticence around it, which is just kind of a fascinating little thing. And talking to other people, I hear similar experiences, especially in the kind of evangelical world that I grew up in. But throughout scripture and Christian history, we see fasting all over the place. But in many contexts, not just in low church evangelical settings, but even in much more liturgical settings, we see fasting mm -hmm. kind of falling out of favor a bit or mm -hmm. falling by the wayside. Yet it's, for the most part, been retained as a, a hallmark of Orthodox spirituality. Why, why do you think the Orthodox Church has been able to retain this? Well, well I, you know, I hope my answer in some way doesn't sound... Um triumphalistic or anything like that. I would just say that orthodoxy views itself today, and that doesn't mean orthodox Christians always live up to this reality, as the living church, the connected body to the apostles, an unbroken chain, you know, from the time of Christ and his apostles till today. Um, and so there's never been a point in that living tradition in which fasting was not incorporated into the everyday lives of followers of Jesus. Now, that being said, I think one of the aspects that has eroded um, the Christian experience in the West has been a reliance on the, the individual, you know, that I, as an individual, have faith in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I have a personal relationship with Him, and that's it. That's kind of what's needed and all that's needed. And I would say that the Christian church never viewed Christianity as a um, solo sport. It was always a team sport. Um, one of the phrases I love is, there's only one thing you do alone. And that's go to hell. Hmm. What you need to do to go to heaven is to do it in community. You know, we go to heaven in relationship. And, and heaven is a banquet. It's a, it's, a, it's a communal supper with the Lord and his saints. You know, we're, we're not alone in heaven. And that's true on earth. If, if we wish to live a heavenly existence, then we live it in relationship with God and with one another. St. John's kind of more forceful. He says, you know, someone who says they love God but hates their brother is a liar. Because how can you say you love God and not love your neighbor? So fasting, fasting is communal in the church. It's one of the reasons why I think it's retained its place, because we do it together. Um, and we don't do it on our own. Um, so we just today exited a fasting period, um, the Lent of summer, the first 15 days, right, that come to us in August, that conclude with the Feast of the Dormition. We'll have another communal fast at Advent starting November 15th. There's another communal fast that begins in the spring or late winter, um, right before we get to the celebration of our Lord's resurrection at Pascha called Lent. And there's another one at the beginning, end of spring, beginning of summer, 
the apostles fast. There's four seasons in which Christians within the Orthodox tradition are fasting together, a common fast. There's also the fasts that are kept each week on Wednesday for the betrayal of Christ, Friday for his crucifixion throughout the year. There are special fast days, fast day of the cross, which will come on September 14th or this month, August 29th, the fast that accompanies the beheading of St. John the Baptist and the commemoration of his martyrdom. And then there are the fasts that are connected with the receiving or the fast that's connected with the receiving of the Eucharist, which occurs every time a Christian receives the Eucharist, they begin a complete fast um, the night before and until they break the fast, breakfast, break the fast with the reception of the true food, uh, the Eucharist of Jesus Christ, his body and blood. So I think the communal aspect, I think also um, the saints have been universal in proclaiming and teaching that fasting is a spiritual necessity. You know, spiritual progress can not be fully realized without fasting. And it is intimately connected to prayer and almsgiving. Now, I didn't make that connection. <laughs> the Lord Jesus did in Matthew 5 through 7. And what I think is so in powerful in, in, his, in his introduction to these spiritual disciplines is he says it this way, when you fast, he doesn't say if, it's assumed. And we, we know later when, when his disciples are questioned why they don't fast, or he's questioned why his disciples don't fast, he says, well, they can't fast now. The bridegroom's with them. But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, and he's referring to himself through his crucifixion and his ascension. And in that day, my disciples will fast. And they'll fast as a way of reconnecting to the absence of and the return, the eventual glorious return of the bridegroom. And, you know, in addition to that, we, we need to understand that you know, if I, if I say prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and I make it like a little stool, and I remove one of those legs, and it's just prayer and almsgiving, it's going to wobble and topple. And so we, we reintroduce fasting, and let me give you a simple way in which, let's say, fasting is connected to the two. If you try and pray on a full stomach, if you try and pray when you've indulged every passion, every appetite that you have, you're going to find prayer will elude you. I know that one of the early pieces of advice I received from an older, wiser priest was, before you pray and before you hear confessions, make sure you fast. As we reduce what the body <laughs> needs and desires, it allows for the spirit to take a more prominent place. In another way, fasting is connected to almsgiving. As I reduce what I consume, as I reduce my, my appetite, that excess is then given to the poor. So I think, you know, in many ways, fasting was just so incorporated into the life of faith. Um, and there has no been any relaxation because the theology and the understanding of its purpose and place is so ensconced in the life and liturgy and cycle of the church that to remove it you know you would you would pull a thread out of that tapestry if you will that is the church and the whole thing would sort of unravel um, as opposed to being viewed as sort of an add-on or you know a, a selected uh, spiritual discipline if one so chooses and also to be honest um, when we speak about fasting in the Orthodox Church. There is a wealth of tradition in the positive sense, a wealth of experience, a wealth of witness to what that means. And so one can learn through others and their experience and the wisdom of the church on how to do it. But to avoid the legalism and the idea of sort of a work based salvation that maybe might creep into another person's mind or heart when they are divorced from that living tradition and connection 
with the apostolic church. That's super helpful. And you anticipated, I think, a little bit where I wanted to go there, which is wonderful. Um, but you mentioned that, you know, there's that tradition there to help people from slipping into like a type of legalism. Before we started mm -hmm. this interview, you mentioned that your parish is made up of many, many converts. And <laughs> I'm curious, I, I imagine a lot of those converts coming into the church, they probably, fasting probably wasn't like a hallmark of their spirituality prior. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe for some, but I'm guessing not for most of them. Yeah. I'd be curious, as, as you're pastoring them and you have this experience, are are there common maybe challenges or pitfalls you see people running into with fasting that maybe someone listening to this could perhaps avoid uh, by knowing them in advance? Well, the first enemy of our souls is always pride, um, which is what was exhibited in the garden. When I talked about it, I talked about it differently because sometimes when you use the word pride, people just shut off. You know, it's just a too often used word and it's not really unpacked or amplified in a way that people can understand what you mean. So I talked about self-direction and self-disfigurement. That's what pride does. And so when people go about pride, pride go about fasting in, in a way in which their pride is at work um, and they're self-directed, they're in trouble. That, that includes me, you know. So uh, the church prescribes the fast. It prescribes how one fasts, what to fast from, when to do it. <laughs> Funny story from seminary. I got to seminary and, you know, I, I knew of the fast. I'd, I'd, I'd fasted and I decided on my own I was going to fast even more strict than what the church required. And... Um, I was with um, my spiritual father, and I was confessing, and I was exp I was explaining to him what I was doing during the fast and how I was keeping it, you know, more rigorously than everybody else. <laughs> and um, he rightly discerned spiritual pride there, you know, those being self-directed. And I wasn't um, living within the communal aspects of the church, but rather going at it on my own, making up my own fast. And so he said, here's what you're going to do. I'm giving you a therapy. Um, maybe in English, poorly translated word, maybe an obedience. I want you to stop fasting. And I want the people that you go to school with in the cafeteria who are also seminarians and they are fasting to see you break the fast. <laughs> because he realized that my fast did not have humility to it. And that it was in a sense... A very public thing, a very prideful thing. So that's one of the key things that I tend to see. You design your own fast um, and you become self-styled in a way that leads you to think falsely that you're more pious or godly than someone else. The other thing is that people can become very rigid or legalistic and I have a recent story that illustrates that point. Um, I was recently invited to go speak at the National Convention for the Antiochian Orthodox Church here in America. It was a great honor to do so. And at that conference was the Patriarch of Antioch, um, Patriarch John. Well, he had been invited earlier in the week out to the Monastery of St. Anthony, which is outside of Phoenix. Um, and he was received there by the abbot and the brothers, and he brought his delegation um, from Antioch with him, and some of the priests of the archdiocese. And it was a Friday, it was a fast day, meaning that in the Orthodox tradition, it's a vegan diet, uh, and a very modest one. And so they received the patriarch, there was pleasantries, and they had a prayer service, and they sat down for refreshment. And the monastic community there served some of the fruits that they grow, some watermelons, some oranges, and other citrus fruits and vegetables. And then to celebrate the patriarch's arrival, they served ice cream on a Friday, which is not part of the fast. And several of the priests that were part of the delegation and who, you know, saw that serving of the ice cream as a breaking of the rules, didn't eat their ice cream. 
Meanwhile, the patriarch, the abbot, the monastics, all ate it with smiles on their faces. And they celebrated the patriarch's visit with a little treat. So legalism can creep in and a type of scrupulosity and rigidity, you know, that isn't the heart of the fast and which also ignores, you know, the, the rhythms, the feasts, the celebrations of life. That's not to say on, let's say, Holy Friday, if the Patriot had visited, they would have served ice cream. That, that would have been a little bit different. But here it was, what we would call an ordinary Friday. There was no special fast or feast going on. And they made ice cream. So a lot of times when people are new, uh, they, they tend to operate, you know, almost like John 8. You know, the, the law says that she must be stoned. And Jesus, of course, disabuses them of that by saying, well, if you haven't sinned, go ahead and pick up a stone and hurl it at her. Um, and he does not condemn the woman. And similarly can be said about, you know, new people to fasting. That's one of the big mistakes they can make. Um, and then I would just say, make sure that when you're fasting, that you're, you're doing it with direction and, and within the community, you know, not on your own. I really love those two stories. I think it highlights various elements of it so well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a, a wonderful way of illustrating that. Well, last but most certainly not least, uh, we, we come to almsgiving. And mm -hmm. almsgiving is a, a word that probably people don't say in their you know, normal day-to-day -day life no. uh, outside of perhaps the church. Um, and so perhaps we can talk about just a little bit of what it is. Um, mm -hmm. But... I think a lot of people, when they hear it, they might just think of writing checks, you know, yeah. and having their tax write-offs, if you will. Um, and, and while financial giving is part of almsgiving, is an important part of the Christian tradition, you write that something powerful happens when almsgiving involves also gaining proximity with those in need. And I thought this was a really interesting point and way of getting into this conversation of what almsgiving encompasses. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate yeah. on yeah. what almsgiving is and why this proximity angle is important. Yeah. You know, in scripture, there are several points in which we hear the Lord Jesus having compassion on someone. You know, whether it was the leper I mentioned earlier that he healed by touch, he had compassion. Um, or in the story that is illustrative, um, the Good Samaritan, it's a story told in the Gospel of Luke. And the word compassion is used when the Good Samaritan sees the man that has been robbed, beaten, and left for dead. It says he has compassion. But unfortunately, the word compassion in English doesn't fully draw out the meaning of what the word there is the biblical Greek. Esplaknithise. That's a tough word. <laughs> Don't expect any of your listeners to be able to repeat it. But it literally means that the inner nobler parts of one person felt and turned at the seeing of the suffering of another. Mm -hmm. Here we mean like the noble parts, you know, the noble parts of our innards, right? So it's sort of like your guts turn. I remember learning this aspect of compassion as it relates to our love of the other, which, you know, we're using the word almsgiving here, and, and not really quite getting it until I had children. And one of my child, one of my children, uh, my, my firstborn, we were playing on the bed. They were little and they fell off and landed headfirst and their neck tweaked in a way that, that was really scary. And before I could think, react, anything, my guts turned. You know, what happened to my child was felt immediately in me. And what we learn about the Lord Jesus is that that's how he feels at all times, in all places, with all people who are in need and are suffering. He identifies with them in his own body, in his own spirit, in his own mind. His whole body feels what they're feeling. And that's what it's saying in that parable of the Good Samaritan, when the Good Samaritan has compassion. It's not simply that he's like, oh, I should go do a good deed. 
oh, I need to give this guy some money. I need to help him with his wounds. But rather, he has proximity to the suffering of another. He feels in himself what the other one is feeling. And so if, 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 you're, if your listeners have an, a chance, I would, I would encourage them to go look at the Orthodox icon that depicts the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan is depicted as Christ, who is the Good Samaritan. Uh, the fathers do something with this parable. They, they blow it up to say that the man beaten, robbed, and left for dead is really also symbolic of humanity. And that's what the evil one and all of the demons have done to us in sin. It's, it's robbed us of our inheritance. It's stripped us of our humanity. It's beaten our true selves and left us for dead and will die. And Christ comes into the picture and he heals and rescues humanity. He sets us upon his own beast of burden, which is what happens in the parable. And he takes us to the end, the church, and he pays for our recovery. You know, he dies on the cross and he washes away our sins and cleanses us and even returns later to make sure that we're okay. You know, the second coming. So anyway, if you look at that icon, though, you're going to notice that the two, the priest and the Levite, who are told in that story, pass by on the other side, are off in the distance, and in the foreground is the suffering person, and their eyes are averted. And Christ is up close to the man who's been beaten and left for dead. He's touching him and looking at him. He's gotten close. There's proximity. And not, as you said, should we discount our financial giving. No, that's important. We should be good stewards of the financial resources we have and use them to um, help those in need. But we also need to get around the poor and the needy because we're impoverished. And sometimes our material goods lead us to think that we're not. And we learn something. And it's not we come alongside and we're above and they're below. But rather, in proximity, we get to the same level, maybe even lower, and we draw near. And in the meeting, we're humbled, we're transformed, we connect, we, we move towards relationship. You know, the, the rich man and Lazarus, another story in the Bible, why does the rich man go, go to a place of separation from God? The poor man sat, Lazarus, at his gate, begging. And the rich man knew his name. And he never went up and interacted with him. And so proximity, gosh, it's, it's just so important. And compassion is, is a, a literal connection between ourselves and, and those around us. And that's what we need to practice as Christians. Yeah, you know, I was very fortunate uh, at a young age to go on a, a lot of mission trips and, and get to see a lot of the world and encounter a lot of things in that. And I remember one time coming back and talking to someone and them looking at me kind of point blank and saying, like, mm -hmm. wouldn't it have been more efficient to just send the money rather than just kind of send mm -hmm. a, a team down there? And, and thinking of that kind of like transactional versus mm -hmm. transformational mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. there, right? Like the power, mm -hmm. not just for them, but so much for us of having that experience and being around them. Yeah. And I remember, you know, without fail, it seems that every time people would come back and after a week of, you know, they used their vacation time to, you know, build a, a church and they're covered in concrete and all of these things, they say, I feel like I got more out of this yeah, than the people sure. are helping, that it's a, such a powerful experience. And speaking of this, and for the viewers listening, uh, Father Evan did not ask me uh, to bring this up, but I, I came across this and just couldn't help but uh, bring it up because I, I think it's just such a beautiful thing, and I personally want to know more about it, and I'd love to shine a light on it, is um, a nonprofit that you're part of uh, called the St. Nectarios Education Fund. And I think it's just so fitting as we're talking about almsgiving. Could you talk a little bit about what this is, maybe how it got started, and what, what the work they're doing today is? Yeah. Well, I've been blessed and fortunate to be around incredible people who've had a, a heart for serving and, and serving those who are 
in situations that I often didn't encounter. And one of those was a beloved friend. Um, he was from Africa. He's passed away. His name was Akunda, Athanasius Akunda. Um, and he became um, a bishop. And we went to school together. We went to graduate school. He was, as I said, from Africa. He was from Kenya. And he had all these letters underneath his dorm room bed from students in Africa who couldn't afford going to school. And, and he shared them with me eventually. And out of those conversations, we worked together to start a fund that could send kids to school. It started off really humbly with just eight students and giving each of them $50 to get them into school. And grew from there to hundreds of students and eventually to the building of schools and to date through you know the incredible work of so many others and generosity of them not me uh, there are over five schools and thousands of kids you know who've, who've been able to go to school through people's generosity um, four of those schools are in uganda one of those schools is in kenya uh, if you want to look at pictures of the schools you can go to snef snef.org um, unfortunately the last couple of years we've been on hold because covid really put things on hold uh, around the world, but in, in Sub-Saharan Africa for sure. And our last project, which we completed right as the pandemic really ramped up through 2020 and into 2021, um, was a sanitation project at one of the schools where we uh, brought in, you know, sanitation facilities and new latrines and bathhouses and um, capturing of water that we could purify through ceramic, fil ceramic filters and storage tanks. And, um, and, you know, we're hopeful, you know, by the close of this year and the beginning of next year to begin um, um, a new set of projects in, in Uganda. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the many things that I've got to witness other people's generosity. I, I can't say my own. Um, that along with another one that is a recent project. I, I know you didn't ask me, but I'm going to shine a spotlight on it Please as do. well. It's called yeah, Paniya's Pantry. It's a it's a feeding program in rural Ecuador um, where we provide uh, family meal kits to around 100 families per week. And uh, if people are interested in that, they can they can go to uh, the Facebook page for um, Saint Spirit on Philoptohos, P H I L O P T O C H O S, or just look up Panagia's Pantry, P A N A G H I A. Uh, Philoptos is uh, the Greek word for lover of the poor. Panagia is the word for the mother of God, the all holy mother of God. Um, but Panagia's Pantry, or now Panagia's Ministries, which also now does medical um, assistance and, and housing assistance. Um, and, and two beautiful people that are living with the rural poor in Ecuador, Bill and Patty Kermitis. Um, but you can also go to St. Spiron's website and go to our donate page and see Panagia's Pantry in there. It's about $25 a month to, to assist a family there. Those are two projects of, of many that I've been a part of that really, not me, others, uh, I've just been a part of them and, and to be part of seeing people's generosity and love uh, for for others that, you know, and then visiting them, whether that's also Project Mexico, it's another thing that's near and dear to my heart and the St. Innocent Orphanage that people can look up. We've got a full-time missionary down there as well. So, you know, such an important thing to get involved in. Find, find your place, find your, your way uh, of sharing the love of God directly with those in need. Thank you so much for sharing those. And I'll try to remember to put links to all of those in the description. And we, we live in a time of such great need, but also mm -hmm. such great opportunity for yeah. those of us that it's easier than yeah. ever to yeah. be able to give and, and help these things um, and, and to participate in something that's not just helping others, which should be enough on its own, but is also going to help us grow in our spiritual lives as almsgiving, mm -hmm. fasting, and prayer are mm -hmm. all going mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. here. Yeah. But, Father Evan, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. It's oh, been a true joy to have you on. Joy. Um, well, I, I, wanna, I, I know that yeah. we didn't get to everything. I tend to be too long-winded, but I no I worries at all. the opportunity to just visit with you, Austin. And as I said, there's lots of people that are benefiting from the work that you're doing. May, may God continue to bless the work of your hands for his glory, 
for the building up of his church, for the salvation of souls and the transformation of people's lives. So thanks for doing what you're doing. It is absolutely my pleasure. And it was uh, a joy to have you on. I'll have links to all of it. And the good news is that uh, even though we may not have gotten to everything today, people can find your book, which I'll also have in the description if they want to learn more. Uh, But Father Evan, this has been a pleasure. And thank you so much for your time. I say thanks to everyone who watches this time sometime in the future as well. I don't take your time lightly. And until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. But far more importantly than that, go out and love God, love others, because truly above all else, that will change the world.